in the Q&A unless there are really burning questions or requests for clarifications, because otherwise I would like to uh, introduce. The, yeah, I see a hand coming up there in the back, please. I have a question. Okay, can we take then this question and then we'll move further? Could you please identify yourself and ask the question? Okay, my name is Shea, I'm a journalist. Yeah. The oil car people, do they have any self-defense mechanism in Belgium? Okay, anybody specifically you would like to... From the panelists? Who would like to respond? Can you finish your question? <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, Can I ask you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you understand the Did you understand the question? Okay. Well, the question is why we don't have self. Can you do you have any self defense mechanism for your ethnic uh, minority in Burma? Self-defense mechanism. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. In fact, you got, it's amazing. It's amazing from all point, legal point, or I mean, the, uh, whatever you say, uh, customary as well. Uh, why we are not defending ourselves? Because uh, the to defend ourselves, this is this right has been given to us by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have our right of self-defense, of course. Even then, we are still hoping on the international community, largely. That we are the only community in the whole of Burma who are not, an arm, who are not waging an armed struggle against the Burmese. Yeah. That may that indicate that we are peaceful, loving people. Yet they are not tolerated. We are not all in the country because of our ethnicity, because of our skin and Southeast Asian appearance, as against the South, the South Asian appearance, as against the South Asian appearance. So you all, I know I understand, this is completely amazing why the people are not defending. As to that means, we request the international community from this forum, please defend us. When our domestic remedies is exhausted, when our, I mean the, uh, what's called national, I mean, we don't have national, I mean, the protection. The protect to protect art is lies in the international community. The, uh, the concept of art 2 is completely applicable in the, the case of Thank you. Thank you. To Kim, you wanted to respond as well? No, it's fine. Fine? Uh, yeah, really? uh, well, this question to a lady, it's a wrong question, I think so, and being a doctor, and for a child specialist, um, I, I mean, we are the people of peace, that you can see it. And this prosecution is not going on today or in 2012. It's been going for, for almost for 65 years, what I understand. And so we were the people who were always seeking for peace because, and then within an Obama, we count ourselves, we are ethnic minorities, but we are Burmese. So we don't want to fight with our own brothers and sisters and in our own country. But we are peacefully asking for peace, which yeah. the peace will bring one day. It will come. We don't need this. If we wanted to have these um, fights and armed forces and then um, separate <laughs> land, that we should have done it after the, um, this Burma had got its independence from the uh, British colonial, right? So we are, we have no interest. We are Burmese. We want to be with the Burma. We want to fight not only for Rohingya, the other, the other minorities in, in, inside the Burma. So we have no interest. Our interest is peace, 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 and we want our rights. That's all. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the next panel is on. It's uh, research communities and NGO, and, and the Nayoshi is going to moderate. So we'll do a quick shift. Please don't leave the room. We'll be back.
Can everybody hear? Okay. So, my name is Anne Dalia Usher. I'm a journalist with uh, Development Today Journal, which is a, an independent journal covering Nordic and multilateral development assistance based out of Oslo. Um, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to bring this discussion a little bit back to, uh, to Norwegian turf, since I, I understand from uh, discussions with uh, Zarni before the conference that it's no coincidence <coughs> that the, the, the conference is organized in Oslo, in Norway. Um, this is partly at least a recognition of the special role that, uh, thank you, that Norway has um, played in uh, in the opening up of Burma over many years supporting the opposition and then uh, uh, being among the first, being the first uh, Western country to engage with the regime, lifting sanctions, um, uh, relieving the debt, uh, and uh, more recently uh, supporting the ceasefire uh, agreements in the north and the east of the country. Um, and so I think there are many people who uh, have a kind of an expectation, rightly or wrongly, uh, that Norway will uh, somehow use this platform, this special role, to also engage in the uh, Rohingya question, somehow uh, play a leadership role among donors, obviously not instead of the government, but among uh, Western actors in the country because of Norway's past engagement. Um, and when I have uh, asked Norwegian officials about, uh, about this question, about whether Norway is planning to take some kind of leadership role in this question, um, they say that no, you know, we, the Norwegian government, we played a role in 
the past. We played a very key, audacious, some people say controversial, role in supporting the ceasefire agreement, uh, agreements. Um, but in this case, in the, in the case of the Rohingya uh, question, we are not taking a lead. We will cooperate with others, we want to be constructive, but we will not be taking a, um, a leadership role. So the question is, you know, why not? Or at least what, what, um, what is Norway's analysis of the situation uh, in Rakhine State? Um, and I, I would just like to uh, say a couple of things about what I've been told. Um, and I do so because I would like uh, the speakers on this panel, to the extent that it's relevant, to speak to uh, some of the, the narrative that we see coming from the foreign ministry in Oslo. An important part of the narrative, which uh, Zarni mentioned in the uh, session this morning, is that the violence uh, that broke out in 2012 was a spontaneous kind of communal violence, that it was a, a natural, if unfortunate, result of the opening up of the democratization process in Burma. <coughs> um, and more recently, as re recently as early May, uh, I uh, asked the embassy, the Norwegian embassy in uh, Burma, what their analysis of the situation is now. And I was actually told, which I, I'm, uh, I, I find it a bit odd to say that in this, uh, uh, in this gathering. They said that in spite of uh, a tense and fragile political situation, the situation has actually improved uh, because there have been no uh, massive outbreaks of violence since last year. Um, and it seems to me that uh, these formulations, this narrative of sort of spontaneous violence as a result of some kind of innate racism or uh, opening up of the country and so on, and, and the, the claim that the situation has improved, that those formulations are fundamentally at odds in contradiction with everything that's been said here. Both cannot be right. Um, and so I, um, I would like the speakers here to, if, if possible, just keep in mind this narrative and uh, to the extent that it's relevant, speak to that. Um, we have very, very distinguished panel researchers, academics, NGOs who have uh, done uh, really unique uh, field work and have field experience in uh, uh, not only in Burma but in Rakhine State. Um, and so um, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Andrea Gittelman, who is from the Simon Scud Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And she's presenting a paper uh, related to early warning signs of genocide in Burma. Go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me from here? Great. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, um, distinguished guests, all the human rights defenders here today. Um, I acknowledge that I am in a room filled with experts on this issue, um, and I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be invited to speak with you today. So just to give you a brief overview of our work, you can move forward. Um, just to give you a brief overview of our work, you might be familiar with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and the director of the museum often says that everything we do, everything, must honor and respect the memory of survivors and victims of the Holocaust. And that's, that's a tall order. And it's not a mandate that, that anyone can take lightly. And we at the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide think that the best way to do that is to focus on early warning signs of genocide today and other mass atrocities, and then catalyze action to prevent such crimes. So this is part of our mandate, and the, the, really the underlying reason why we wanted to see for ourselves what the violence, what the persecution, what the oppression against Rohingya looks like. I'm thinking about the broader work of the Simon Scott Center some of our programs analyze international decision making around past genocides. For example, what happened around Rwanda or what happened around Srebrenica. We try to identify what went wrong and why, 
and when decisions could have been made in order to prevent past atrocities. And today, we are faced with one of those turning points with Rohingya. And I believe we will look back at this time, at this very moment, maybe 10 years from now, and we will either use it as a model for international decision making and how the world rallied to protect a vulnerable population, or we will again try to find out what went wrong and what could have been done better in order to prevent a horrible outcome. And to echo Atun Kin, who said earlier, we, we now all know what is happening. This issue is now mainstream. It's on the front page of our newspapers. That means there is now no excuse not to act. Um, we see you know, increased forced migration, increased flight, and that requires an emergency humanitarian response. But something that we've been talking about today, which is so important, is the longer term response to address the, the push factors so that we aren't just treating symptoms of truly heinous crimes. Um, just my, some of my, my top line takeaways based on the trip that the director of the center and I took to Rakhine State a few weeks ago is that there, there are currently crimes against humanity against the Rohingya and that situation is primed for more atrocities to happen in the future, uh, including genocide. If policies of violence and of persecution are not immediately addressed. And I'll, I'll preface my, uh, my remarks in a moment, but just because we're talking about current early warning signs, um, the context already is so untenable and oppressive um, we as an institution are not just looking at warning signs for the future, what, what bad things, what atrocities could happen in the future, but really that's a sign that the current context must be addressed immediately. So I'll go through some of the early warning signs that's listed in our report and that we found just from speaking with people, from speaking with displaced Rohingya, uh, speaking with Rakhine people, speaking with human rights activists, with journalists, with politicians, Several patterns emerged, and based on what we have researched, looking at past genocides, past situations of mass atrocities, we've identified a few very concerning signs, and I'll go through them one by one. You go to the next one. So as you know, this is a photograph from Um uh, The segregation and exclusion, keeping one ethnic group physically separate from another is something we've seen in past genocides and past uh, situations of mass atrocity it's really a worrisome sign. And to echo some of the speakers before, this of course is not done for protection, it's done because of purposeful exclusion. It's part of a broader policy to keep people separate. Can you go to the next one? This is a, a destroyed mosque. Um, the rampant hate speech, which was mentioned before, is a very concerning sign. A propaganda against Rohingya, against Muslims, against other minorities. And the fact that it's from, from government actors, from pretty much well-regarded religious leaders and other people with influence in the country makes it particularly dangerous. Can you go to the next one? The denial of necessary services to a targeted group, so the crackdown on NGOs, on humanitarian actors, the expulsion of groups, and then undue <coughs> limitations or restrictions on their proper work. Um, this is a, a photograph of a mother and her two children in one of the camps outside Sitway. I'm not sure if you can tell, but both of the children have a, a skin condition. And the mother said that she had no idea how she would ever be able to get the medicine necessary for her children. And she expressed such hopelessness about the availability of, of necessary care. Another worrisome sign is the government facilitation and acceptance of violence against Rohingya and with their assistance of their flight from the country. Um, impunity for the violence that happened in 2012, uh, the special rapporteur has listed in her most recent reports that there has been near total impunity for these crimes. And that sends a strong message to people that that kind of violence is condoned. There's also government support for policies that restrict Rohingya rights. Uh, the denial of voting rights. Um, we talked, uh, my colleagues spoke a bit about the white card uh, withdrawal, the denial of voting rights, how stripping an already vulnerable population of their very identity is seen as just the last straw. Um, this has happened in other situations we've seen historically, and that causes great alarm. Um, the fact that you know, there's protests about white cards um, and that there was such a, a strong and very united 
and very public response to Rohingya voting rights from some extremist kinds is extremely worrisome. So this is just a close up of a white card. When the people we spoke to really wanted people to see that all of a sudden, and as was mentioned before, ethnicity and religion is now listed on people's cards. This young boy showed us his grandparents' cards from about the 60s or 70s, and there was no ethnicity listed, no, no religion listed. It wasn't an issue then. It's a manufactured issue. You go to the next. So just the, I'll end a little bit with my, um, the overall impressions that we came back with on the part of the museum. We saw, mm -hmm. okay. we saw deep mistrust between Rohingya and Rakhine and between multiple ethnicities and the government. And we left feeling that the situation in Rakhine State was a, a tinderbox and the situation is so prime for future violence that an incident, even if it's unplanned, even if it's you know, unintentional and seemingly small, that that could be the spark for future violence. Um, and probably something that I found surprising, um, no one that we spoke to really had, had much hope in the international community, in elections, in all of these points that we, living, living abroad, not living in the country, see as, as possibilities for change. All of the Rohingya we spoke to, everyone who had been displaced said, the election will not change anything for us. Um, so just, just to uh, respond to the initial framework that was set up by the moderator, I mean, we are seeing systematic government action. I mean, all of these early warning signs, they're not accidental. Um, they are purposeful, and because of that very reason, they can also be undone, and I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> The, uh, the next two speakers, uh, Penny, you're not speaking, right? Or are you? Okay. Uh, the next speakers um, are from uh, Queen Mary University of London.